Welcome to our fifth session on transformational leadership. Uh, we who have chosen to be followers of Christ realize that a part of our responsibility is to speak up for the voiceless or to stand with those who have no representatives. Uh, there are so many injustices in the world and when, when Jesus was here on earth, he stood against those systems of oppression. Uh, many of the great works of justice throughout the years have come by Christ's followers who have seen injustice and have not accepted it, but they've stepped up against it. Uh, in our series, we have studied about William Wilberforce. Uh, when he became a follower of Christ, his, his whole heart was changed, and, and so he became passionate about those who were suffering as slaves. He spent his whole life fighting for the abolition of slavery. He put a team around him, and this team uh, found ways to change the narrative and, and also to get unjust laws off the books. We've studied about Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States who saw the horrors of the segregation laws and, and, and spent his whole life, even gave his life in death uh, because he stood up against those unjust laws and unjust systems. Uh, Nelson Mandela uh, fighting against apartheid in, 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 uh, in South Africa. So uh, Gandhi uh, fighting for the poor in, in India and, and he himself uh, faced execution. The cost is often great, as in Christ who went to the cross on behalf of all of us. And yet, we are called to stand up for justice and to, and to stand against injustice. The prophet Micah said, what does God require of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? I pray that during this series, we've been challenged to be transformational leaders. To be effective transformational leaders, there, there are three things that we need to keep in mind. First, we must lead with passion. What is the kingdom assignment that God has given you, and what has He called you to do? The second is best practices. We can be passionate, but we better also be good. We need to be competent. We need to do the best that we can to prepare so that God can use us for His purpose. And the third is, is leaving a legacy. And today, as, as we summarize this, this series, we'll, we'll discern how can we leave a legacy? How can we make those changes that we're seeing take place uh, become more permanent changes? How do we change the narrative in people's minds? And how do we change laws that, that are not just laws and, and put in their place uh, systems of justice? In, in, in the book of James in the New Testament, it says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. Uh, the, uh, we realize that religious freedom is, is one of the things that's been so important to the United States. Uh, for over 200 years, we, we have been guaranteed religious freedom because it's in our U.S. Constitution. In the First Amendment of the Constitution, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, are abridging the freedom of speech, are of the press, are the right of the people uh, to be able to assemble and petition the government a redress of grievances. And now that was written over 200 years ago, and yet today it still protects us. We're able to worship freely. We're able to share our faith with people, even those who disagree with us. It's a part of the fabric of who we are. But the reason that we have that guarantee and the reason that we have that hope and privilege is because over 200 years ago, written into our laws was that, that sense of protection. Well, this, this was not something that just happened all by itself. Uh, what caused uh, the U.S. Constitution to put as a First Amendment this protection for religious freedom? I believe a lot of it has to do with just a, a few people initially. There was a preacher in Virginia named John Leland and John Leland was passionate about religious freedom. Uh, even as a Baptist pastor, he was oftentimes oppressed himself. And, and, and because many had come from governments that had a state religion. And so everyone was coerced or forced to be a part of that state religion. If you weren't a part of that state religion, then you were violating the laws. And so, so John Leland believed that religious freedom should be freedom for people of all faiths. And even for people who, who have no faith at all. And so John Leland began to petition the others in Virginia who had similar ideas. And James Madison, who was one of the main writers of the Constitution, John Leland went to James Madison 
and said, guarantee us that you'll put this in our Constitution. They persuaded James Madison to do that, and it became the first amendment to our U.S. Constitution. So, so one man, a preacher in Virginia, and his team of, of fellow associates who had similar eyes, they put their minds to making sure religious freedom would be available for the generations to come. Well, you may say, well, that's just in America. But did you know in the UN, the United Nations, there's the Article 18, a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where there were 58 countries who came together to start the UN uh, back in, in 1945. Of those 58, 48 voted to affirm Article 18, uh, the UN Declaration of, of Human Rights. Uh, the 10 that, that didn't vote for it, they weren't against it. Some just abstained and, and, and some were not there. In this Article 18, it was guaranteeing these countries around the world, major countries around the world, came to an agreement that everyone has a right of freedom of thought uh, and of conscience. Everyone should have the right of, of religion. Uh, this, this right includes those who wish to change their religion or change their belief. Uh, and, and, and change their freedoms. E either whether they're standing alone or they're in a community with others, whether it's in public or whether it's in private, to manifest this religion or their faith uh, through their own teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Many of the countries today who are being oppressed have actually signed Article 18 of the Declaration of Human Rights. And so if your rights are being violated, by, by your nation or by systems, then you can take them to Article 18 and say, our country has affirmed that I have the right uh, to my religious faith. Well, the way this Declaration of Human Rights came about uh, was, was because of, of a few people who saw that this needed to be a part of the document that the UN created. Now, systemic changes require advocacy. We saw that in the civil rights movements. It's not enough just to have passion, but we need those who will represent us in governments, uh, represent us in the writing and the carrying out of laws, uh, of, of public discourse. And so these, these systemic changes require us to be advocates. We, particularly as Christ followers, we, we need to be advocates. We need to be voices for those who are voiceless. If slavery was going to be overthrown in England, Wilberforce knew that the laws had to be changed. If segregation was going to be abolished in the United States, or if apartheid was going to be overcome in South Africa, then Mandela or Martin Luther King Jr., these people knew that laws and systems had to be changed. Overcoming oppressive systems is uh, 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 overcoming these laws or these practices. It requires transformational leaders who aren't in it for selfish benefits, but rather it's those who are willing to pay a price as they engage the forces of evil with the weapons of peace. The leaders of the civil rights movement in America during the 60s and 70s model this nonviolent approach. Well, who are the advocates? So many times we think, well, you've got to be a politician to be an advocate, or you've got to be an attorney. Well, those are important. It's important for people in government to be advocates for those who are poor. But advocacy is not just a work of lobbyists uh, working in their, in their national or regional capitals. Uh, advocacy can be effective attorneys. It could be courageous pastors. Uh, it could be clever strategists. It could be honorable politicians or, or bold citizens of all backgrounds uh, taking small steps or, or large expressions to support justice against injustice as long as it brings about a systemic change. If, if we're going to make a difference, then many times we have to collaborate with some that we disagree with in some areas, but we agree with in other areas. And so, so who are those partners? And so maybe, maybe your passion is for the unborn child. 
They may be others who are for the unborn child, and, and you may disagree with them on other moral or other social or even other religious issues, but, but you, you can agree with them on that one matter. Well, how can you work together in building collaborations, even with those who sometimes may be different from you? Um, one example and, and I mentioned earlier was the collaboration between uh, uh, the University of Baylor, their collaboration on hunger and poverty, and, and, and with those, the government and, and the for-profit organizations that help to feed these children in, in, in the rural areas. Another example is the International Religious Freedom Roundtable uh, in, 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 in the U.S. And I encourage every country to establish a roundtable uh, similar to the one that's in D.C., uh, there, there are over 200 people or 200 organizations that are represented at the roundtable. Uh, some are Muslims, some are Christians, some are Hindus, uh, some are Buddhist, uh, some are actually humanists or, or people who have no faith at all. And, and yet they come together every week and they discuss situations around the world where people are being oppressed because of their religious faith or their beliefs or their conscience. And so they try to raise public awareness in our own country, but also in governments around the world, of these atrocities. Uh, just prior to the, to the filming of this, this series, uh, there was a, the situation where 140 children were kidnapped uh, by a terrorist group in northern Nigeria. They just showed up for school. And yet these terrorists broke in and they took these 140 children into captivity. Uh, out into the jungles where they may be sold and trafficking or, or they might be recruited as, 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 as boy or children soldiers uh, or, or they might be forced conversion and, and some of them actually are, are even executed. And so in these situations of atrocity, the, the round table comes together in D.C. and people representing these groups will voice public opinion about how these things should not go unchallenged. Uh, within the countries of concern or even within the other nations around the world. Uh, if, if we're going to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, make a difference, then we need to know what our cause is. Systemic injustice requires the dedication and sacrifice of coalitions of like-minded individuals and organizations who will pursue justice with the passion and sacrifice of, of William Wilberforce are, are with others. Well, let, let me ask, uh, what, what, is, what is your cause? Um, are, are, is your cause uh, something that has to do with uh, religious persecution? Or, or maybe your cause is the homelessness or protection for the unborn? Maybe your cause is for the elderly or for foster children or, or, or hunger or racism Perhaps it's plight of immigrants or, or sex trafficking or, 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 or those who are orphans. Addressing these issues requires a lot more than just an occasional prayer or, or making an annual donation. It's something that, we'll call, that we must give our life and our heart to. Systemic injustice requires the dedication and sacrifice of coalitions of like-minded individuals and organizations who will pursue justice with the same kind of passion of William Wilberforce. Laws need to be changed, violators need to be exposed, and false narratives uh, need to be uh, addressed. When, when the Germans were executing uh, the Jews and, and other minority people uh, through Nazism, uh, unfortunately, too many times, the church was, was remaining silent. The church didn't get involved in, 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 in trying to resist these horrible acts that were perpetrated by the government. But finally, some courageous individuals from within the church and within community and society began to resist these horrible acts of injustice. One was a German pastor, Martin Niemöller, Martin E. Moeller wrote this, this, this saying. He said, first, they came for the socialist. And I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. But I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. 
Then they came for the Jews, but I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We cannot continue to tolerate injust, injustice. We cannot continue to, uh, uh, to tolerate oppressive systems and oppressive leaders. Those who are interested in truth and those who are interested in fairness, we must find ways to resist those unjust laws and systems and fight for those uh, who, uh, who, uh, who are, uh, are voiceless. Um, during the 19th century, slavery was just acceptable in, in England and because people wanted to believe the lie. Uh, they wanted to believe that really slaves were better off, you know, that, that, that they were being transmitted from, from, from Africa where they lived in poverty and they were put on ships and they were told that, that in, in these ships they had singing and dancing and food and, and they took them to the colonies or took them to the United States and, and they got good jobs. Nothing could have been further from the truth. But people wanted to believe that because they believed that their economy was based on slavery. They didn't want to admit the horrible facts of slavery because they wanted their own lives uh, to, to be comfortable and, and, and be beneficial. And, and so the, the, the truth was, was disguised. But there were people like Hannah Moore Hannah Moore was one of five girls, and, 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 and she lived in an area where, where, where slavery was very accepted. And, and this, in, in a book written about her, Fierce Convictions, the, the author wrote, as a goldfish swimming in a bowl doesn't know what, uh, what water is, so was the person in the 18th century in Great Britain. They were immersed in an economy and in a social structure built on the slave trade. Uh, they, they could not easily, even if at all, to see slavery for what it was. Uh, to do so, it required, it seemed, a certain kind of, of, of perceptiveness of mind and spirit. And Hannah Moore was, was one of those who possessed that. We're living in such a time as this. God didn't open doors for Hannah Moore to give her natural gifts for her own edification. God had a kingdom assignment for her. She desired, God desired to use her to open the eyes of a nation uh, to the horrors of slavery. Far too often God provides opportunities for his prophets to speak truth to power, only to have them fail the occasion by speaking favorably to those in authority who seek a personal access and, and, and uh, and, 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 and assignment. Well, we've got to be in it to win it. I mean, if we want to make a difference, if we want to fight against those oppressive systems and fight up for the oppression of the poor, then overcoming in, injustice, it, that's not just something that happens overnight. God raises up transformational leaders like you uh, and, and like those around you, raises up them so that from all kinds of backgrounds and, and all kinds of disciplines and vocation, for them to be a part of a movement that calls a nation or a community to repentance and to action. These false narratives need to be exposed and they need to be addressed. Laws and practices that embolden injustice, they need to be overturned. And systems that promote compassion and justice need to be installed. The need is great. The need is urgent. Slavery has been abolished as an institution thanks to William Wilberforce and Hannah Moore and others. These laws of segregation in the United States are off the books because of courageous leadership by people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Congressman John Lewis and, and a cast of others. Yet even today throughout the world, thousands are living in captivity because of human trafficking and, 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 and terrorist groups who are, are taking thousands uh, in, into captivity like they're doing in, 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 uh, in Nigeria. Micah 6, 8, again, what, is a God, what does God require of us but to do justice, 
to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. This year of pandemic, global unrest, increased uh, religious persecution, uh, hunger, homelessness, mass migrations across the world. This has created a world that's in crisis. We need to be Micah 6, 8 leaders who will do justice, who will love mercy, and who will walk humbly with our God. Many of you already are courageous Micah 6, 8 leaders. Uh, you're fighting bravely for justice. Well, transformational leaders are needed in every generation and in every community in order to lead the fight for justice. Jesus' uh, mission was, was clear. Uh, Jesus said when, when, he, when he began to, um, uh, to lead the, uh, the, the people who were his followers, he was in Nazareth, his hometown, and, and just at the beginning of his ministry, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord in Luke 4, 18 through 19. We need to be sure that we don't miss our kingdom assignment. Jesus gave himself to the ministry to the poor. If we're going to be followers of Christ, then we need to be following in his example. We have been privileged to meet some, some refugee children in, in Nigeria. Uh, there's a wonderful couple there that I have mentioned earlier, Gloria and Ben Kawasi. Uh, ben is the Archbishop of the Anglican Church in, in Josh, Nigeria. Uh, they have suffered greatly. Uh, uh, three different times they just barely escaped death uh, by, by those who wanted to silence them. Uh, Gloria herself uh, saw the need for orphans. Uh, these, these children were victims of, 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 of violence in northern Nigeria. Uh, many of them had, had already had their, uh, their, their parents uh, had been killed and, and were left with either one parent or, or no parent at all. Uh, some of them were actually just children that were living on the streets or, or living out in, in, in the desert places or in the woods or in the mountains or in caves in the ground. Well, Gloria and Ben began to welcome these into their homes and creating a school for them. And they even went through the difficult challenge of, of legal adoption for some of these children. And, and so they, they have legally adopted over 60 children. They, they built like a dormitory that these children live in by their house. Uh, and, and they provide schooling and, and, and clothes and, and food. And, but mainly they, they provide loving nurture for these children. They become the mother and the dad, the mama and daddy of these orphan children. Well, we were in Josh, Nigeria, and we wanted to go meet the children, so we went to their house, and, and we came, and when we walked in and saw all of these children that were there, and, and they saw Ben and Gloria Kawasi, then they began to scream. These children were some as, as young as 18 months old and some as old as 18 years old, and they saw them come in, and they, oh, mommy and daddy, they were excited, and, and, and they knew that they loved their parents, and their parents loved them. Well, as Anglicans, they, they had a, an evening worship service every night, and, and so they allowed us to come in and be guests for this English worship service. We were able to listen to these children. These children began to sing songs that they had learned and, 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 and tell the stories of how God was working in their lives. And then I guess for us, being there from America, they sang a song to us in English. These children were singing this song, standing in front of us, and they were singing, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. When I saw in the faces of these children who had been thrown away children and now were living in the nurture of a good family with a mother and a daddy, when they were singing, Jesus loves me, I was thinking to myself, Jesus does love these children. And I also thought, so do I. <laughs> I love these children that God has created in His own image and likeness. Those people who are crying out, who are hurting, who are living under oppressive systems, they need courageous leaders like Moses, 
are like the Apostle Paul, are like Wilberforce, are like you, are perhaps me. If people who are willing to pay the price to speak up and stand for truth and justice and mercy. I'm so grateful you have joined us for this series. I pray that these tools might help you to know and to fulfill the kingdom assignment that God has for you. God bless you. Go in peace.